Hi, and welcome to episode eight of Who's Zooming Who? Thank you very much for joining us uh, once again. With me this week is a good friend of mine, Dr. Gerard O'Sullivan from Cork Institute of Technology. Like myself, uh, he's a fellow Corkman, um, but we don't just talk about that all the time. Um, Gerard is originally from West Cork, uh, but is now living in East Cork, whereas I myself am from North Cork. And what you'll probably recognize there is that Cork is this unique county that we have uh, north, east, and west, but we don't really have south because the whole place is is is, is down south, I guess. Garoj, you're very, very welcome to Who's Zooming Who. Um, Garoj is the head of technology enhanced learning in Cork Institute of Technology, as I said. Uh, recently ran a very successful um, online course for the National Forum um, on getting started with online teaching, uh, and is actually talking at a National Forum seminar just next week on a open educational resources. So that's my introduction of Vicky Road. Perhaps you'd like to add to that or enhance it or um, to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Right. Well, thanks for the, thanks for the geography lesson uh, about Cork and Cork County there. Um, yeah, I've been working in this whole area where teaching and learning meet uh, technology for uh, 25 years now, despite my youthful appearance. Um, a lot of that time I was working on uh, commercial projects and EU funded projects and um, in recent years, as you say, I've been uh, head of the Department of Technology and Enhanced Learning um, and I suppose part of the idea behind uh, that department is to maybe take some of those um, skills and offer them internally and, and, and offer those kind of services uh, internally in CIT. So we've been uh, quite successful, I think, in terms of rolling out a lot of uh, fully online distance education programs, uh, doing a lot of stuff in the mainstream, uh, including the rollout of a new learning management system, as you'd be aware. Uh, but we continue to do a lot of external work, actually. Uh, as you know, there's always a next big thing coming along in uh, the whole kind of e-learning or digital education area, which is what makes it so interesting. But when it all works right, it's a bit of a virtuous, um, some kind of a virtuous circle for us, I suppose, where the exploratory research we do uh, feeds into the, the mainstream services and the, uh, the mainstream services, I suppose, bring a certain realism and a certain uh, kind of end user insight uh, into, the, uh, into the exploratory research uh, that we do. So all in all, look, we're, we've, we've fl plenty, plenty going on internally and, and externally. Fantastic. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And, and more than myself and, and probably a lot of people listening. Um, we're just here now towards the end of May and we've probably um, passed over the, 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 the peak, uh, I guess, of um, both online delivery and online assessment. And I guess you, you're getting to the end of that or maybe you have just got to the end of that yourselves. Um, you mentioned there that you moved uh, comparatively recently to a new learning management system. You went to Canvas. Um, I, I'm glad, I, I'm guessing you're glad that she had moved uh, and weren't in the middle of the move before uh, all of the COVID-19 um, closure uh, kicked in. How has, that, how has that gone for you? I mean, I know you went through a very extensive consultation process that I was very impressed with, actually, um, how you, you put it all together in terms of evaluating um, what your options were. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it all went... Uh it all went very well. Um, uh, took a took a lot of time, took a lot of effort, but uh, was worth it in the end. Uh, we we had a very open process. I think anybody who so much as indicated an interest in the institute learning management system having uh, some feature or another had their feature added as a requirement in a, a quite lengthy request for tenders that eventually uh, went out. So we consulted very widely. It was quite a participative uh, process. And um, I think as, as a result, in the end, we ended up with a learning management system that delivered on a lot of um, key things for us, I suppose. Um, I, I, I suppose in a way, I, I would say uh, Canvas was the system we ended up with, that, that it's a good balance, let's say, between say an open, a truly open system, an open source system, uh, because it has open APIs and it's relatively easy to integrate um, other platforms and tools through, um, through, through LTI. Uh, but 
it's obviously a commercial system and you know we um, get commercial services i suppose including uh, tier one support um which has been so helpful um in the current during the current crisis so 24 7 support for staff and uh, and students uh, we, we knew that was a good thing to have before COVID-19 came along, but uh, it's, uh, it's been very, very important to us. Um, on top of that, I suppose mobile support was something we were looking for, and um, Canvas does a very nice job of that. And uh, we did a lot of work actually in figuring out the kind of um, the user experience with, the, with this learning management system. So we got white label versions of the different candidate learning management systems, we um, had a, a, a cohort of staff who had uh, volunteered to be part of this study and we brought them in and asked them to do representative tasks without any instruction on the various different learning management systems we've been uh, looking at and uh, Canvas came out on top. But I suppose, you know, as I said at the outset, we continue to do a certain amount of commercial work, but um, quite a lot of EU funded, National Forum funded, Enterprise Ireland funded work. And we're... Uh, we're we're pretty agnostic. We would we would use uh, Moodle quite a bit, and traditionally would have used uh, Moodle for clients who were looking for some kind of uh, turnkey solution. You know, so if they wanted uh, content, but also wanted um, a platform in which that say content was hosted, we'd often take uh, Moodle, as I know you have in in WIT, and uh, skin it up, I suppose, uh, for, for them, depending on what their uh, what their requirements were. So. Although we're we're quite keen on Canvas and pleased that we went with it, we you know we're we're fairly agnostic really when it comes to LMS and and lots of other um, technologies in this space. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I'm a big fan of Canvas myself, and anytime I've used it, I've always been um, impressed by it. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, yes, we we, we do use Moodle. Um, or at least right now, we use Moodle, and that we don't have any immediate plans to change, but. Who knows? Um, interesting, you touched on, on the mobile thing there, because um, we're seeing probably about 25% of our traffic to our Moodle instance in WIT will be mobile. Um, and it's probably increasing now. Haven't looked yet at the stats over the last um, little while in terms of the mobile breakdown. Uh, but I do remember, uh, now the mobile, the, I probably should say that the Moodle app is getting better, um, like all of these things are. Um, you know, nothing, nothing stands still, I guess, in, in the online environment. Um, but I do remember stopping one of the students one day who was looking to set up the, the mobile app, and I was kind of saying, like, do you mind me asking why you're using it? Because, like, we weren't actively promoting it. Um, and, and her answer kind of stunned me, and it was, she, she accepted that the user experience wasn't as good as using it on a desktop or on her laptop computer. Um, but the, the trade-off for, for her was that uh, her mobile was always on, so she could take it out of her pocket, she could get online uh, or get to the learning materials in seconds uh, as opposed to minutes, and this was her sitting on the bus going into town, this was her um, sitting in the canteen for a couple of minutes or shortly before a class, and it was just that sheer yeah. convenience. Um, it's kind of was, learning, by, was, learning by stealth is the phrase. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. No, it was it, it, it was a big eye opener for me because it was just probably, um, and it, when she said it, it sounds blatantly obvious, but it was just um, a kind of one of these penny drop, uh, one of these penny drop uh, moments. So during the the you, you mentioned um, having that tier one support and twenty four seven, um, which I'm slightly envious of actually, now that you mentioned it, um, um, support. COVID-19 in a CIT perspective, um, yourselves no more than all the rest of us got the, the news on uh, that Thursday, the 12th of, of March. Um, I know that we had started doing some preliminary sort of planning and speculating as to when the closure was likely to come. And I think most people were, weren't expecting it to happen for probably a week uh, after it did. Um, so we, we thought we had days um, rather than hours um, but as it happened you know we found out 11 a.m uh, that six o'clock that evening was the the, the last time mm -hmm. and any campus teaching was going to happen how have you found the experience um did everything work pretty much the way you expected it was going to or was there any sort of 
um, big, oh, I wish I'd known that before um, or the starters. Or, um, how, how, how did it go in general? Um, in general, I think it's gone, uh, it's gone quite well. You know, staff have been, have been great. Now, you and I have spoken about this before, Ken. And um, I, I think this, is, this has been a general experience. Staff have been uh, really great in terms of um, meeting and navigating the, the, the challenge and being very appreciative for the kind of support and training we did with them. I think one of the early good decisions that got made in uh, CIT was to declare the following week a reading week. And that really gave us um, opportunity to uh, provide training and offer reassurance and um, get a lot of stuff out there that it would have been very hard to do if, you know, if this was still a sort of a moving train, if you like. So in the end, we, we made a kind of a strategic selection, I suppose, of the tools we thought people would you know, would like to use to try to, I suppose, emulate what they do in the face-to-face -face classroom. So option one, I suppose, was using Canvas and, and, well, using the Institute LMS and all that that brings in terms of, you know, hosting content, assessment, uh, communication, collaboration, student management, what have you. Option two for us was to go a bit further if you wanted to create kind of more media-rich interactive content. Um, excuse me, to use a kind of... Um, um, uh, a screencasting uh, piece of software. Um, so a fair number of people um, were interested in doing that. We could see the number of people who drew down the pro licenses and it was over 300. Um, and then we also uh, rolled out uh, a live e-learning solution called Big Blue Button, which is kind of integrated into Canvas anyway. Um, in parallel, we use, uh, we use Zoom. And since then, actually, we, we've started using uh, Microsoft Teams quite a bit, and we've built an integration um, be, between our, our LMS and uh, and Teams. So, like, we have a lot of data, I suppose, as to how things have been going, and we've taken a lot of uh, courage uh, from it. Um, obviously, we moved quickly, like yourselves, from questions about of delivery to questions about assessment, and now questions about doing uh, results processing, and pretty soon. Well, uh, right now, really, I suppose, questions about August exams, August assessments, and uh, what's going to happen in September. So there hasn't been a whole lot of time for, let's say, critical reflection or um, any kind of debriefing, if you like. Um, but by and large, I, I hope, you know, uh, things, have been going, uh, things have been going relatively well. We've been calling it remote teaching. And we've been doing that, I suppose, in a way that's meant to be uh, inherently contrastive with, call it proper e-learning or proper online learning, because uh, we, we, we have been doing quite a lot of that. Over the years, we've, we've 25 uh, fully online programs, and uh, obviously there's time with those programs to put a lot more CPD together and um, provide a lot more kind of direct support to them. When those numbers go up, when you're suddenly looking at supporting over 9,000 students and nearly 1,000 staff, then um, obviously support models and uh, everything else has to, has to change quite a bit. But I expect, you know, we'll be reading about this, this time in EdTech journals for a very, very long time to, uh, to come. Yeah, I, I've, I've, no doubt, I've no doubt that we will. Um, look, no more than yourselves, our, our experience to a certain extent, largely mirrored that, and, and we've wrestled with lots of the same sorts of challenges and um, probably faced them in very slightly different ways. Uh, the only bit that I guess um, we don't have a direct involvement is in there of those items you mentioned was the results processing, but that, that they had a kind of an electronic version of that that was reasonably robust and well developed uh, in WIT anyway, so um, it was good that we didn't have uh, that bit uh, or have, have as big an involvement in that. One thing that has kind of struck me, all right, I mean, I know the word that has been around um, and I've seen it used um, for, for the, uh, the general ed tech response to the COVID-19 crisis and the general education uh, response is that it's, it's demonstrated 
um, a resilience maybe that we didn't realize was there. Um, I'm going to probably go a little bit further than that um, in that I, I'm probably going to give, give, give this guy his, his name wrong, but uh, Nicholas Nassim Talib in his book Anti-Fragile um, argues that um, systems that get stronger when they come under pressure. Um, so I, I, I'm going to posit a theory that perhaps um, no more than yourselves in CIT or ourselves in WIT, when the pressure came on, um, these systems that weren't really designed to do this sort of thing or weren't, weren't introduced uh, with a view to doing teaching remotely at scale actually facilitated um, a, a remarkable um, emergency response um, and rapid response um, to, 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 to a crisis that um, none of us could have foreseen or even imagined a mere six months ago. And I suppose part of that for, for me, um, Gerard, is that it probably wasn't any one thing. I mean, in, in your um, response there, you, you spoke about several different tools that were interlocking and, and interrelated. Um, but that's built on the back of students having devices, having smartphones, having laptops. That's mm. built on the, on, 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 uh, the back of notwithstanding the fact that there isn't a national broadband plan in place just yet, but lots of our, of our bigger towns and, and certainly our cities have a decent high-speed uh, internet. Um, and I imagine there will be very little resistance to the national broadband plan. Uh, well, yeah, there, 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 there certainly shouldn't be. Um, there certainly shouldn't be. But I, I'm kind of buoyed by the fact that, you know, all of these independent systems that were kind of brought in for different reasons and existed for, you know, lifestyle reasons or whatever, suddenly made all of this possible. Um, and, and you're quite right, this isn't proper online uh, e-learning or online learning um, or even tech. But, uh, okay, maybe it is technology enhanced learning, but at a, at a very low level. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm hanging on to the anti-fragile one now is, is that, it, that what, what we're doing is... Um, That's great. I, I must look into that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it is the case that for many of us, we've moved from maybe quite a peripheral role in the college, um, supporting, you know, mostly supporting face-to-face -face, um, traditional delivery with, um, you know, learning management system, maybe some other things and, you know, a small, relatively small number of, uh, of online programs to really, you know, being the, being the, um, the key, I suppose, to, uh, to, to academic continuity, to, to, to um, continuing on with the traditional business of, uh, of teaching and learning. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a kind of a breakdown case, really, I suppose. You know? So obviously, that capacity has been there for some time, and those of us working in the area have long argued that uh, you know, um, building ed tech capacity is the best way to uh, prepare for an uncertain future, if you like, and, and the best way to give ourselves, uh, give higher education institutes um, agility and, um, you know, um, robustness, I suppose. And, um, you know, I think, um, I think our case at least has been, has been quite strengthened by, uh, by, uh, by, the way, by the way things have yeah. gone. You, know? you, you, you certainly hope so. In terms of your, your fully online courses um, that are run out of your own department, so you're the Department of Technology and Enhanced Learning, and I know you run a Master's in E-Learning that one of my colleagues yeah, yeah. Uh, undertook uh, last year. We might talk about, a little bit about that in, in a moment as well, but um, have you had to modify the delivery of those in any way, or have they just continued on business as usual, or... Um, how has the how has the crisis impacted on those, if at all? It, they've largely continued business as usual, except for certain programs like the Masters in E-Learning. We are serving people who are themselves at the coal face. Uh, so uh, we have a lot more students than we would have had in previous years looking for deferrals and extensions and, and, and so forth. Um, I can see in a lot of the uh, assessments we've set, obviously COVID-19 um, becoming a very important focus, let's say. I was only doing student presentations there on Saturday for a module I teach on the Masters in E-Learning. And uh, one, th this particular presentation they do was a bit of kind of um, 
futurology, you know, looking towards future trends or maybe looking at something that's kind of here already, but they, they feel might become a, a greater part of the mainstream. But um, almost none of them, none of them, I would say, uh, failed uh, to, to make uh, a reference to COVID-19 and, uh, and, and what it has kind of revealed, I suppose, in terms of the, I would say, the hidden structures of things, really, you know. Um, and, you know, there is, there is a sense, I think, that, uh, you know, it's COVID-19 is something of a no-return valve. We won't be going back to exactly the way things were, in a way, although a lot of people, uh, understandably, uh, would like to. Uh, but, you know, hope, hopefully people will have experienced um, th the affordances these different technologies and platforms can bring. And uh, even if and when we return to campus-based teaching, they will continue to find ways to, to, to use them to support their teaching and learning goals. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you certainly hope so. Um... So your master's, perhaps you could ha have a quick chat about that. I mean, some sure. of the people listening uh, may well be interested in being prospective students. Um, so be great. Okay, thanks. So, 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 so I'll, give you, I'll give you a, an opportunity for your, your elevator pitch. Um, to, to give it a plug. Um, okay, so um, the master's degree is put together specifically to equip uh, graduates to go out into the world and build pedagogically effective cutting edge um, e-learning solutions, whether that be in the e-learning industry, in industries where e-learning plays quite a big role, or in obviously, you know, state funded higher education and, and state funded um, education and training in, uh, in general. Uh, it's a master of arts. Um, so the orientation is towards kind of pedagogy and design and communication rather than um, technology uh, per se. Uh, the people who teach on it uh, have all spent uh, uh, quite a lot of time, uh, I suppose, working, um, I suppose, in the very environment that we're preparing our students for. And actually, most of our students are already in that environment themselves. So most are engaged or engaging to some extent um, in the world of uh, in the world of e-learning, as broadly defined, uh, at least anyway. Um, uh, we in, I think we enjoy having the course ourselves. Uh, it's a useful way for us to try out new technology. We can always sort of uh, try out things with the masters and e-learning students, and if it doesn't work out, we can afterwards say, "Oh well, I'm sure that there's a lesson in that for you, wasn't there?" You know. Um, we also learn from them. I was talking about presentations there on Saturday about you know future trends and and, and so forth and. Uh, just really, really fascinating um, stuff that the students are working on themselves or plan on working on or see, um, see possibilities uh, for. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's about it. Thanks for the, the opportunity no, no, if anyone is it, um, yeah. interested. Um, and, and it's a, a two-year course? Actually, sorry, I should have said that. It's a 60-credit master's. So it's, a, it's quite a fast route to qualification. So you can start in January and be finished in September. Uh, but the, the, the gotcha is we uh, insist that people are either uh, coming to it with the equivalent of a level eight in multimedia or creative digital media or are already engaged and have been engaged for quite a while uh, with the world of, uh, of e-learning. Now we do have a bridging route, uh, a, a kind of a single semester um, certificate that people can do to bring themselves um, up to the necessary level uh, before uh, beginning the masters. But yeah, it's a, it's a pretty fast route to qualification. As I say, mind you, you can do it on what we call an access basis, which is sort of a credit accumulation scheme that CIT has. So we um, we're pretty small classes, maybe. 18 to 20 typically, which seems to be just a kind of a, a nice size in terms of there being, I suppose, not too many students to uh, get around to and um, at the same time enough to have a good kind of vibrant online uh, online learning community. F fantastic. It, 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 it sounds great. Um, as I mentioned, one of my colleagues, Connor, I completed I think just last year, and uh, remember, he, yeah, yeah. He, he certainly had good things to say about it. So, how, how many years is the course running now, Gerald? Gosh, I'm not sure offhand. Maybe six years, I think. Um, 
So um, I suppose yeah, came out of our experiences of doing a lot of that uh, commercial work, and um, CIT at that time had just really, I suppose, started going in for uh, online distance education courses uh, in a big way. Uh, so we decided uh, let's practice what we preach. I suppose let's put out a course in the area of uh, of e-learning, and and let's deliver it online and. I suppose partly as well, we were aware of other master's degrees that were out there, which, you know, seemed to fall into two different categories. They were either kind of software development or computer science-y type master's degrees with some e-learning added, or they were master's degrees looking at e-learning perhaps as an interesting pedagogical practice, but which didn't have a kind of um, a practical uh, bent. So I suppose we see... Uh, e-learning as as almost like a sub-discipline or we practice it perhaps as a sort of a sub-discipline of design really I suppose and we because of the work we had all previously done as individuals in CIT and outside of CIT we were kind of aware of what the needs of industry were for people who understood instructional design but at the same time were you know quite strong in terms of using things like the Adobe Creative Suite and understanding how to act as an admin for learning management system and understanding um, various different important technical web standards and then technical uh, e-learning standards and we're able to I suppose kind of keep an eye maybe on on um, on, on developments uh, in the in the area as well you know as I say there's always a lot of uh, new things coming down the line as well as there's, there's always more things potentially coming down the line that then transpire to be um, coming down the line. But, um, you know, it's, I suppose it's, it's trying to produce people who are curious about that and who are, call them reflective practitioners, if you like, uh, and who know how to do uh, a bit of a lit review and, and get a sense of um, where the, uh, what the effect size of, of different uh, technologies might be or whether things are truly pedagogically effective or just um, the latest kind of shiny thing, if you like. Brilliant, yeah, and, and I think that's, that's uh, curiosity is, is always probably uh, my biggest driver. I probably should have mentioned at the start um, when, when, we, when, we, when I gave you the introduction, um, I don't know how I managed to leave it go this long and I, and I forgot. Um, CIT or Cork RTC as it was when, when I was a student um, is my own alma mater. Um, I was there for a couple of years in the, the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, pretty much ran out the door when I finished. Um, but that, that says more about me than... You're, um, you're welcome back any day, Ken. <laughs> but no, I, uh, but that, that, was the, that was the next thing I was going to say. I did, I did go back in, in 2008 and at the time I was working in the motor business and uh, done a what I'm guessing was probably a level six cert in garage management and organization with uh, patochocracy in the uh, trades department. And it's, um, the most interesting part about going back um, to, to, to CIT as it is now after being out of it for over 20 years at that stage uh, was that whereas some parts of the college had changed completely, um, other parts looked almost exactly the same and, and you'd, you'd sort of turn one corridor uh, and it was almost like um, traveling back in time to... to That's right, uh, to, the, to, to, the to, famous uh, 1974 building. Yes, um, but no, I had, I had a great time there. And um, I've been back, obviously, since and, and seen your own uh, very, very nice offices and your impressive collection um, of learning technology uh, gadgets and, and gizmos. And anybody um, who... Uh, ever finds themselves with any excuse to go to CIT, um, and if you can make even an excuse to see our road, uh, definitely check out his uh, Museum of um, Educational Technology Toys, I, I suppose. And, and better again, if you have anything in the attic, uh, g give me a shout. I know <laughs> Apple II or something like that. We'll, we'll name a wing of the library after you. <laughs> so before we finish up, because I'm, 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 I'm conscious I'm eating into your uh, leisure time of a, of a Sunday afternoon. You've been, very, very, you've been very, very good to, to, to spend some time talking with me. I mentioned at the start that um, you have been recently involved in the uh, National Forum um, course, um, Getting Started with Online Teaching, which is something that yourselves um, and UL and RCSI, if I get the three partners right. Uh, it was originally Hibernia, but okay. then the, the individual in question, Dara Cassidy, moved. Yes. 
um, Royal College of Surgeons. So yeah. So, so you delivered that online recently using the forums Moodle platform, um, and I'm guessing maybe there's a plan to do it again at some stage in the future or yeah, not. Yeah. We um, um, we did we did it last year actually for the for the first time, and uh, it was very successful. Uh, we were really um, pleased, I suppose, with, with uh, how it went. We um, did, did had a few different uh, I suppose, data gathering methods that that we applied. That that gave us the sense that um, we had succeeded in in um, changing people's minds. I suppose a bit about online and giving them the sense um, that they were maybe ready to take the uh, the plunge with it. All of the people who took the course, incidentally, ha had indicated that they were either already engaged or were going to some uh, were going to soon have to be become engaged. Um, we've actually written a few papers about it afterwards. Uh, uh, talking about, um, for example, the, the the fact that you can get a digital badge and um, um, how that kind of played into people's engagement and motivation. Um, but yes, we we did it again recently, and COVID nineteen came, I think, just towards the end of the course. There was maybe two or three weeks or something left, and uh, really pleased to see people continuing on. Um, um, uh, with the course and the the various different triads as they're called that the forum had um, suggested we set up really doing their job in terms of uh, supporting uh, people to support each other uh, if you if you like uh, it's a very interesting model there's a kind of a cascading effect I suppose whereby a number of people went on to do the facilitator course so they will now take that course and deliver it in their own uh, contexts um, so uh, I was actually uh, presenting at a, at a webinar uh, last week on, on digital badges. Um, and um, there was a huge amount of interest in the fact that the National Forum um, has pushed out this kind of um, professional development initiative uh, across Ireland and has these, uh, th these various different badges associated with them. I don't know, is it 17 or 18 or something? Uh, different um, courses that have been uh, provided at, uh, at, the, at this stage. I think I've been directly involved in, uh, in, uh, in four of them uh, at this stage, but a wonderful uh, initiative. And it was great to have the chance, I suppose, to uh, look at what we had done, revise it, um, and, uh, and push it out again. So real kind of iterative uh, design process for, for us, I suppose. Yeah, no, I, I have to admit, I'm a big fan, and, and I'm probably slightly biased in in that I like the concept of digital badges, um, first and foremost. Um, and I think, you know, certain people may not necessarily have the, the time to commit uh, even to a rapid masters like your own one, um, yet having some acknowledgement um, of, of, of having gained skills is good. Uh, the other thing you touched on there, um, the, the triads, and yes, I've seen that used in the forum because I facilitated one of the programs which with Marie O'Neill, who was a, a previous guest on here, and um, myself and Marie actually first met um, as triad members um, on the on the first go round of the course. And uh, even though we were a triad of two, which uh, because the third person never showed up, um, I, I think the concept of you, you, you just you know a lot of the time when you sign up for some of these online courses. Um, your commitment at the time is good, but then the real world um, gets in the way. Um, but when you're in a triad, and now you're not just making a commitment to yourself, you're making a commitment to the other people in your triad as well, that you will do the work that you say you're going to do, and you'll turn up for meetings that you say you're going to turn up for. Um, it just kind of maybe ties you in a little bit more, um, or in the case of, as I said, we were a triad of two, and in the case of the third person, scares you off a bit more as well. But um, it def I, I, I don't think the first time that I undertook that PACT uh, course, if Marie wasn't in the triad with me, that I would have finished it. I probably yeah. would have. Yeah. Um, I, I, love, I, I think whatever you know the online courses uh, and we'd be the same with the online programs and CIT you need to find replacement therapy for the college bar or the college cafeteria yeah, yeah. there has to be some kind of a, a third space or social um, space in which the students can uh, 
meet and uh, share their frustrations and concerns and offer mutual support yeah. and uh, and all of that good stuff and particularly as you move towards you know providing courses for for professionals and and providing master's degrees for for working adults there's a lot they can bring to that um kind of uh, kind of situation um in fact that, that might be one of the concerns i'd have for um for for september you know when we think about very dependent learners that we have at the undergraduate level whether they'll be whether they'll be able for that whether or not we put these triads or, or some other kind of um you know online space in in, in place um I, I i wonder if if those learners are ready i mean we've very deliberately have steered away from putting full um undergraduate courses online for example that there are 90 something percent of our courses are um, uh, master's degrees or special purpose awards and explicitly uh, marketed, I suppose, or promoted to uh, to working adults. Um, yes. So yeah, the triad thing is, is great. The, the online um, communities are great. But I, I wonder about the ability of, of our, our more dependent learners to, uh, to navigate those spaces um, successfully. Absolutely. Look, it, it, it's very much a challenge, and I think it's a challenge that both you and I will be, uh, and, and many more, by the way, not just, not just you and I. So uh, Mostly you and I, though, Ken, really. <laughs> well, okay, okay, maybe it is just you and I. Um, we'll, 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 be, we'll be wrestling with. I suppose that, that, that sort of affirms my own belief um, that a lot of the time, um, aside from the academic and the knowledge transfer that, that obviously goes into learning, you know, learning is a social experience uh, as much as anything else. And it's that, it, it's those interactions with um, people in your peer group, the, the relationships that you build up with people. And while, I, you know, I'm an advocate of online, obviously, and I believe that you can replicate some or all of that uh, online, but it has to be more carefully, um, it has to be more carefully constructed and more carefully built. Um, that you don't always get the time for that with, with large groups of undergraduate students who are coming in from, you know, what they're what what they've been used to um, in in the, the, their their secondary schools. Having said that, I suppose the group that will be joining us in September, and um, their schools were also closed, so well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they're not probably the same as um, the, the the students that arrived twelve months uh, twelve months. 12 months hence. I'm conscious that, that, that we're almost up on time. Um, but before we go, I did want to briefly mention that on Thursday of this week, which will be tomorrow, the day after this uh, webinar, uh, or this, 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 this podcast goes out, um, you're presenting um, at the OER uh, webinar that the forum um, are running on open educational resources. Um, and you're going to share the excellent resource that you put together uh, I'm guessing it's about three three years ago at this stage, I think, when I first noticed it, uh, tell you that, uh, me. So before we finish up, perhaps, you might just give us a, a, a brief um, a brief introduction to the webinar on Thursday and, and obviously tell sure. you um, as well. So I, I suppose just to, just to begin, I suppose we've always been big believers in the whole area of open education resources, perhaps even before the term open educational resources and open educational practices came along and we'd be linking that area as opposed to the whole um, tradition and ideology of, uh, of open source, which obviously um, plays a very big role in, in the history of um, in the history of computing and the history of the web uh, and the internet. So it was, we, we would tend to share everything that we create under um, a Creative Commons uh, license. And so it was with this Tell You uh, project, which we did, yeah, three or four years ago. Um, we got some funding from the um, National Forum. We had partners in what was then DIT, uh, UCD, um, and, uh, and, and Tralee, um, and um, created this collection, essentially, of granular um, free online courses, essentially designed to help busy educators get the most out of technology to support and enhance teaching and learning. Uh, in the end, we created something like 150 uh, micro lessons online, uh, a lot of them quite kind of media rich. 
and um, all of them shared under under Creative uh, Commons license. Sorry, I forgot to mention UCC were part of the uh, were part of that initial group as well. So DIT, UCD, uh, Institute of Technology, Trinity, and uh, and and UCC. Um, since that time, um, we've presented on it in a few different um, fora. And we've got um, some interesting correspondence from all over the world. Uh, people have stumbled across the site and uh, have found the lessons useful and have written to us to, uh, to, to thank us or, or indicate to us uh, how they've taken that content. And, uh, and we mixed it for their own purposes, which of course is one of the big uh, advantages and, uh, and virtues of, of open educational resources. So tune in on Thursday and uh, we'll, we'll tell you more. Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Um, I could probably keep talking for tonight, but uh, that wouldn't be much good to probably you um, or, or, or to the people who take the time to, to listen to, to the podcast. We've been talking for um, almost 40 minutes at this stage. Um, so all that remains for me to say, um, and I've really enjoyed this talking to a, a fellow Corkman, um, but all that remains for me to say is Dr. Garola Sulawan, thank you very, very much um, for your time um, and your openness and for sharing uh, your stories with us um, and the very, very best wishes for uh, the rest of this year and obviously the start of the next academic year. Right, back at you, Ken. Thanks, for, uh, thanks very much and, uh, and the best of luck to you also.